Good afternoon. Is this on? We're on? Okay. And welcome to all of you to the 30th Annual Laverne Gallman Lectureship, which is being presented by our NIH-funded P30 Center for Transdisciplinary Collaborative Research in Self-Management Science. And that center is directed by Dr. Mi Young Kim, who is with us somewhere here today. There she is, she moves. So uh, thank you. They are the, in the organization that uh, put all these ideas together and has organized it here today. And I thank her staff as well for making that possible. As I mentioned, this is the Laverne Gallman Lectureship. And I cannot personally believe that it's been 30 years that this has been going on. But it's a very special endowment and event for our School of Nursing. Uh, typically, when we have a lectureship, a single donor writes a check and establishes a lectureship in their name. That is not what happened for this endowment. It's quite a different story, and I'm sorry I have to tell it again, because I think it's worth all of you hearing if you don't know it, especially students. So in 1984, one of our new doctoral uh, program graduates, uh, Mary Lou Bond, and several of her former classmates pledged $500 each. Uh, to start the fundraising to establish the Laverne Gallman Lectureship in Nursing. And it was in recognition of Dr. Gallman, who was the graduate advisor for many, many years at this school. And Dr. Bond sent letters out to all the master's uh, students and alumni, as well as the doctoral students and alumni, while Jeanette Hartshorn, who was the president of ANGS at the time, our Association of Nursing and Gradu Nursing Graduate Students, spearheaded the work for those students. So I can remember I remember being a poor, I can still remember being poor, a second year doctoral student at the time. And uh, I was thinking $25,000, that's what they had to raise. And I thought, well, that's impossible. How will they ever raise that from students and new alumni? Well, um, the graduate students uh, greatly valued and deeply appreciated uh, the work Dr. Gallman did, and they did support this effort. Students, graduates, faculty, staff, and friends did what was seemingly impossible in 1985, and they gave $26,500 to create that initial endowment. The Regents matched it under the Regents Endowed Teachers and Scholars Program and doubled that endowment to $53,000. That was a lot of money in uh, 1985. And I have to personally say that was the very first donation I made to this university. And so I remember it as that. And it's really exciting to see how it has grown over time. Uh, for those of us who are uh, part, have been part of that initial effort and also great beneficiaries of a great educator, to see her name live on. She did um, die a couple of years ago. Now that endowment is over a quarter of a million dollars. Dr. Gallman continued to fund it herself many times and left a gift in her will as well. So for many years, as I mentioned, we were blessed to have her here for this lecture. She always came and, and was always thrilled to see our new students and, and faculty that were continuing. And I used to consult with her and say, Dr. Gallman, you know, is this OK? What do you think about this lecture? And she would always say to me, you know, Alexa, I'm in favor of whatever helps the students. You decide, bring a lecturer that will help the students. And truly, that summarizes her great career at the University of Texas at Austin. So now, uh, as part of my, I'm thrilled to welcome you here, our students. Uh, it's great to see a bunch of different faces, people from other disciplines, as well as some of our advisory council members here with us today. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Marge Benham Hutchins, an assistant professor of nursing, who will introduce our most distinguished speaker. vertically challenged. Can you hear me okay? Great. I want to start, I'm, I'm pleased today to be introducing our guest. And I wanted to start with a question. How many people here have seen his, uh, the video, the TED Talk video? Show of hands. A lot of you have already seen that, let patients help. And that video tells the story of in 2007, when our speaker was diagnosed with a rare and terminal cancer, he went to online sources, online patient 
support groups, and through that, he was able to discover a treatment that eventually saved his life. That video has gone viral. If you haven't seen it, please go on and see it. Over half a million views. It's been subtitled in 26 languages. So Dave has gone on to be the, one of the world's leading advocates for the pa patient advocates. World's leading advocate for patient engagement. Among his many accomplishments is that he's the co-founder and current co-chair of the Society for Participatory Medicine. That's for patients and providers. Check it out and, and come and join us. Uh, he's a health policy advisor. He's testified in Washington on the uh, patient access to their medical record under the Meaningful Use, the Electronic Health Record Meaningful Use Initiative. He's the first patient to have been inducted in the Healthcare Hall of Fame, Internet Hall of Fame. This year, he's a Mayo visiting professor in internal medicine. He's a very, very busy person. But in his spare time, he's a blogger. And his blog is now archived by the National Library of Medicine, has been since 2012. He's authored three books. The most recent, which you see up here, is Let's Patients Help, Patient Advocacy Handbook. On a personal level, I'm so pleased to see everybody here because I want to share my excitement. I am very, very inspired by his story, by his passion, and his calling for the patient engagement movement. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and fellow e-patient, Dave DeBroncart. <laughs> I'm a little on the hyper side, so I prefer the lavalier mic. Um, it's great to be here, and I really am honored and grateful for the recognition uh, that this lecture uh, gives to the patient engagement and patient clinician partnership movement. Uh, a, a quick note about my name, I'll explain what e-patient means. I worked in marketing before I got sick, so when I started blogging, and it was actually John Lobkowski, uh, who's in the front row here, who taught me about Twitter back in 2008. This guy has been doing social media before the internet came along, I'm not kidding. And he was, you know, back in the era when people were saying, who cares what you think, you had a tuna sandwich for lunch, because that's what they thought Twitter would be good for. He was saying, I'll tell you what it's going to be good for, and he was right. Uh, anyway, I picked the name ePatient Dave, and having worked in marketing, I knew that a consistent brand is important. So my website now is ePatientDave.com. On LinkedIn, I'm ePatientDave. Everywhere you go, you Google ePatientDave, and I pop up, which is good because my real name is DeBroncart, and nobody knows how to spell that. So anyway, uh, I have so many things. Uh, this is a homecoming. The e-patient movement started 20, 22, 23 years ago in Austin. The founder of the movement, Tom Ferguson, who you'll hear about, uh, was from Austin. That's how he knew John. That's how John and I met. Um, we will get to that. The important thing here, the topic I was asked to speak about, is how patient-clinician partnership changes what's possible. There is much ugly argument going on right now because this is a social movement, and like all social movements, people resist and get angry. If you're on Facebook, you may have seen this week, there's a new coffee mug picture that's circulating saying, please don't confuse your Google search with my medical degree, which has so many dimensions of wrongness <laughs> to it. Well, but there's the blog of our Society for Participatory Medicine is epatients.net. And there's a blog post there that I wrote the other day about it. And there's like 60 comments with some doctors saying, keep your damn Google out of my office. And some patients saying, but Google solved a complex diagnosis that my, my doctors hadn't found. And back and forth and back and forth. It's a time of culture change. It's a social movement. How I got here, I worked in high-tech marketing, specifically typesetting machines, if you can believe that. Now, you want to talk about an industry that changed? <laughs> All right? Well, you know, there's a parallel here, a relevant parallel, because what killed the typesetting machine industry was that one of the core assets, fonts, got loose from inside the industry. 
It used to be if you wanted to use fonts, you had to either own a typesetting machine or talk to somebody who did. Well, now you all got fonts in your computers and most of them in your phones. And in exactly the same way that people say patients are doing stupid things with health on the internet, we said, you can't handle the health at a time. You don't, you don't know what you're doing. You're doing stupid things. Don't mix serif and sans serif and so on. Well, what happened is y'all got smarter, all right? And a really important thing happened. The whole industry, once you had the power, the whole industry drifted in the direction you wanted and away from the direction that the manufacturers of the machines wanted. And that's what's beginning to happen in healthcare. Anyway, in 2007, I discovered I was almost dead and got better. True story. I'll uh, cover that briefly. In 2008, I learned about the e-patient movement, because it turns out, lucky me, in Boston, my primary physician, Dr. Danny Sands, who's the co-author of that book, he knew Tom Ferguson also, which helped save my life. <laughs> And in 2009, that society was formed, and the people started asking me to give speeches. I'm like, what? I don't know anything about medicine. Um, what happened, to make a long story short, and this is the power of social media plus traditional media, I discovered, anybody remember Google Health? It was like Google was going to collect all your medical record information uh, and take good care of it for you. And I blogged, it'll be a cold day in hell when I trust Google with my health information. And, but then, early in 2009, I had a blog post with devils on ice skates. Cold day in hell. Because I had decided that I was more interested in encouraging innovation than I was worried because what made typesetting become desktop publishing and explode was that the people who had the problem had access to the assets and they could innovate. And I decided that's what I wanted healthcare to do. Well, one thing led to another. I discovered, because of Google, that there was garbage in my medical record. And I blogged about it, and the Boston Globe newspaper called and said, we think this is important. And so the people have said this was like a Disney movie. Blogger in Nashville, New Hampshire, and his recliner blogging away. The newspaper calls, and they put it on page one, no less. So now we have the newspaper flying out of the movie screen at you. And it was a week before a conference in Boston. Somebody said, is he patient Dave here? And I was up in the balcony. I stood up. Somebody took out her iPhone. And uh, the true story tweeted, Pope Dave preaches from the balcony. Uh, and, a week later, I was at my first policy, a month later, I was at my first policy meeting in Washington and people started asking me to give speeches. Highly improbable. Anyway, I felt a calling. I've had lots of good jobs and I've been very happy to be alive for a long time, but I've never felt like I had a calling or reason I'm here. And so, well, anyway, 2011 at Wendy International, I did the TED Talk. One of the senior physicians at my hospital, Warner Slack, has been saying since the 1970s that patients are the most underused resource in medicine. Now, I don't take this lightly. I know there are some people who talk about, well, let's just listen to patients and sing Kumbaya and healthcare will get better. I'm trained as an engineer. I have an engineering mind. I want to know what happens that makes this work. So, and I have no medical training, so I, let's just hold that question in our mind. Here's one key thing that is mentioned in the book that I co-authored with my doctor. Everyone performs better when they're informed better. Okay? The increasing access to information brought on by the internet changes what's possible. It does not make me an oncologist. It does not make me a nurse. It does not make me anything. But it changes what's possible for me to contribute. To deny this is to be out of touch with reality today. Right? And it holds back progress. The corollary is it's perverse to keep people in the dark and then say they're idiots. Say, well, no, don't give them that information. They won't understand it anyway. Why? Because they've never seen any, so don't give it to them. But this is a, the core of five years of speeches here. So theme one of today's talk is reality has changed. Theme two is, well, uh, continuing theme one, there's been a profound shift in where competence and information can be found. All right? And that profoundly alters what patients can know, which changes what's possible in medicine. But social movement time, when what's possible changes, people tend to resist. 
I have a few slides later on about some parallels with feminism. Theme two, culture is changing. Now, I'm going to, now the, the university in the Netherlands, on the German border, the town of Nijmegen, um, funny Dutch names, you know, Radboud University Medical Center, they are profoundly out in front of most people's thinking. There's a man there named Lucien Englund who will no longer speak at a medical conference, even for pay, if they don't have patients involved in producing the event uh, so that it's designed from the patient's perspective. And this August, they launched a new curriculum for their medical school developed over the last two years with patients involved in the, the, the redesign of every clinical course. Can you imagine that? All right. Well, they asked me to speak there, and I mean, it was a hot August day, and they, they, they had too many people for any auditorium, so it was out in the sun under a tent, and the fans weren't working, and I said, I gotta do something about this, so I started with Bruno Mars. Shit, that ice cold, Michelle fight for that white gold. This one for them good girls, them good girls, so, straight masterpiece. Styling, uh, wildin'. In the longer talk, I can actually do some of that, and I got myself a white fedora. But the, uh, we will return to Bruno later. Why would I be up there? I turned 65 this year. All right, and I'm up there dancing like a fool in front of the 18 to 20 year old, 22 year olds, because they had they had the pre-meds in there as well. Um, think about 65. We'll return to that too. In 2009, those crazy the followers of Tom Ferguson, including John Lepkowski, uh formed the Society for Participatory Medicine, and they did, they did this interesting thing. They said this medical society cannot be run by just a doctor or nurse, the way most are. It has to have a patient. So they named my doctor and me as co-chairs of this society. Now this was not necessarily a brilliant thing to do logistically because. You know, to, to paraphrase, paraphrase the line from Gone with the Wind, I don't know nothing about putting no medical society, you know? Uh, but look how my doctor holds the computer screen. Between us, EMRs these days, electronic medical records, are widely known for having horrible usability. 800 clicks to order a cup of coffee, you know, <laughs> relatively speaking, you know? How, well, and people say, patients say, the doctor, the nurse isn't looking at me. They're dealing with the computer and vice versa. The doctor and nurse are saying, I'm dealing with the computer. He puts it in the middle. You know what? Sometimes he makes typos. And he's not allowed to change them afterwards once the note has been signed off. They have to add a correction. What a mess. So we work on it together. There's a program called Open Notes. When I say a program, it's a, it's a I don't mean a software program, uh, where a lot of hospitals, including mine now, are letting you see from home the doctor's actual visit notes, what they wrote in all their medical lingo. This was designed, this program, it was a three-year study funded by Robert Wood Johnson. It was created to answer the worry of, well, you know, if we let patients see the medical record, aren't they going to swamp us with stupid phone calls, like, why do you call me an SOB? No, sir, that stands for shortness of breath. <laughs> well, it turns out the study demonstrated, number one, that didn't happen. Number two, surprise, surprise, patients did better at following the plan if they could look it up on, online. Who knew, right? But we have this mystique about medicine that makes us not doing medicine things that are common sense elsewhere. So anyway. Uh, Health Leaders Magazine, which goes to hospital executives, got wind of this, and they sent some reporters and talked to a bunch of us, and much to our amazement, they made it a cover story. They called it the patient of the future. Now, important point here, because I'm a cultural change agent, but I don't just look at what I think is right. I listen to how is the establishment hearing this, because that's one of our measures. So if we had gotten a founding grant, and we had spent money on a PR firm, and they had made this happen, it would have been, dude, excellent, you got us a cover story. But they didn't. This was the editors of Health Leaders saying to hospital executives, and they look in the circle here, a new relationship. It's not about what doctors, nurses do different and what patients do different. It's about the changing relationship. Now, they sent a photographer to take pictures of some of us. 
Uh, and uh, I just figured it'd be the usual black and white head face photo cut into a column of text. I would have worn a different shirt if I'd known they were going to do this. Okay. <laughs> full page on the table of contents. I was like, you know I didn't have a publicist with me, right? But in a way, think about this. What the editors of Health Leaders were saying is that the patient of the future is a middle-aged slump with a paunch looking stuff up on the internet, right? And that's uh, in a tacky shirt, no less, right? Well, you know, when I'm at home, it's like having a, um, an online meeting where, never mind, we won't get into that. Anyway, every December, they do 20 people who make healthcare better. Number one on the list that year was the phenomenal Atul Gawande, the surgeon who writes these amazing lectures, uh, the, the columns in the New Yorker and books on surgical checklists. Number two is Dean Kamen. He's best known for inventing the Segway scooter. But he was first honored in medicine in 1976. Did you know he invented the first wearable insulin pump? It was a backpack at the time. This time, he was, uh, he was there because his company was making amazing robotic limbs for amputees, wounded warriors, accident victims, and so on. Imagine my shock when number three was me in that stupid shirt. <laughs> Like, what am I doing on the same page with these guys? But importantly, number four was Danny Sands, my primary physician and one of the 12 co-founders of that society. What they were saying was that in their view, this revised patient-provider relationship, all right, belonged on the same page with the Tool Gawande and Dean Kamen. Now, th again, this was still 2009. I was, my life was spinning out of control. One of the mysterious things that happened in that summer was, uh, I, I mean, I was fresh out of cancer and we had a financial disaster and the housing market collapsed in 2006 and 7. Last thing I wanted to do was go off and just pursue something just because my heart was in it. And I actually said, one of, one of our colleagues, founders of the society, was Susanna Fox, who until recently worked at Pew Research. Extraordinary woman, she now works at HHS. Anyway, I had a call with her one August day where I said, you know, I really want to pursue this, but I can't afford to like, be without benefits and so on. It would be great if I could get a half-time job with full benefits. The next day, the company CEO called me in and said, you've been spending too much time in Washington. We're cutting your job in half, but don't worry, you'll still have full benefits. Woo. I can take a hint, so I did it, you know? Well, so I'm thinking, am I an indicator of the future? I've known plenty of people who said, man, I know I can just make a killing with this company, and they went out of business. Well, so, but I looked for evidence. I said, well, who's getting online? Well, I've been online since 1989 on CompuServe, right? Way back when with modems and pay by the hour and all that. Uh, Susanna Fox's research at Pew said that 20 years later, 83% of US adults were online. Now, the people who say, stop Googling, well, good luck. For heaven's sake, could you please, like, modernize? If we're not good at it, help us get better. You know, that's what professionals are supposed to do. Well, but that's just one data point. You know, by, by that one marker, what this piece on the Monopoly board did was an indicator of the future. But I looked for more. Uh, I've seen plenty of people go out of business with just one data point, you know, as their business case. And I thought, well, who's romancing online? Ladies and gentlemen, I found my wife on the internet <laughs> in 1989. I had been in a distance relationship with a woman in Florida. When that ended, I live in New England. When that ended, a mutual friend uh, told me about uh, Match.com, which was I'd never heard of. And within a few weeks, I had discovered Virginia a mere 13 miles away from me. I was like, dude, I'm going on a date in a car. <laughs> uh, and a year later, uh, I'm, a, I'm a data geek, and I learned how to give speeches when I worked in marketing. I had to go give a speech in Paris about data. So we got hitched and made a honeymoon in Paris out of it. <laughs> 10 years later, one in eight weddings in the US was people who met online. All right, and two years after that, it's one in five couples met online. What's possible for people to find what they're looking for has changed because of the internet. 
Now, people will commonly say, be careful, patients, there's garbage on the internet. Well, I assure you, if you've ever been on eHarmony or something, you'll know. I, before I found Ginny, I went through some suboptimal search results. <laughs> but also, I didn't marry the first one that popped up. All of us, when we're new at something, don't know what we're doing. The remedy is not to smack people down and say, stop that. It's to develop their abilities. Everybody, when they were new, and you may most recently remember this as your grandmother, had this moment when they were new to email, this moment when they said, holy cow, I'm related to a Nigerian prince. I'm going to be rich. <laughs> Well, and this is, this is important here, because when I testified in Washington for patient access to the medical record, all right, like, let me look at what's in there, for heaven's sake. A very well-meaning response was, but that stuff is complicated. Have you, you ever seen the language they use in there? Uh, and people, people will get frightened and so on. I pointed to when my mother was uh, 22, she had three kids and a traveling salesman husband who uh, was never home, and she didn't know how to drive. Cars in those days had a really stiff clutch on them, and the culture was full of jokes about women drivers, always depicted as crumpling the car's fender and so on. I said the punchline, said, it's a mistake to judge people's potential by what they do when they're new at something. You know, the punchline is insurance statistics today show that women have one-third fewer accidents than the men who used to make fun of them. You know? So think forward, okay? Don't get stuck in your habits. Well, Tom Ferguson, summer of 1969. I was 19 years old. Humanity landed on the moon for the first time. Some of you may recognize this slide is from my TED talk. That was the first photo ever taken of the Earth from another surface. A few months later, Woods, excuse me, three weeks later, Woodstock happened. What a wild time. In case you don't know, Woodstock was the first big mega music festival. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. Uh, and that fall, the whole Earth Catalog was published. It was a hippie self-sufficiency journal. Uh, the how to grow your own food, build your own house, not, be, not depend on the man, you know? Uh, live an independent life. Uh, that's me that summer. Um, full more hippie. Don't ask what that tube is coming out of my mouth. I will not tell you. Um, I will note, by the way, that when I spoke in Alaska in September at the Allergists Conference, Alaska has full legalization of marijuana for recreational use, and one of the presentations that day was on how one thing allergists need to be aware of is that while typical recreational dope back then had a THC content of two to three percent by weight, the highest that's being grown commercially now is that they've seen is 33 percent. If you can imagine stuff being 11 to 15 times more potent, holy cow. Well, anyway, a few years after this, Tom Ferguson came out of Yale Medical School. Uh, and he never practiced medicine, but he understood the vast majority of what we all do is take care of ourselves. You know, I got a boo-boo on my finger, I take care of it, I have various sprains and so on. But that when trouble hits, the thing that primarily limits our ability to accomplish something useful is access to information. And when the internet came along, he saw that that changed what's possible. Now I'm talking, I mean, in the 1980s, before the, the internet was a public thing, he published a magazine and then a book called Medical Self-Care. Uh, you can tell a lot about futurists like this by how their predictions pan out. There are a lot of people who make predictions, but consider something. 25 years later, Tom was the medical editor of the Whole Earth Catalog's Millennium Edition. All right, and John Lepkowski here, what did you say was you were in charge of? Consciousness. The consciousness. <laughs> section. There we go. I like a book that has a whole chapter on consciousness. Wow. Um, anyway, look at these very early PowerPoint slides that Ferguson published. There was a version of this in this book. 
This, was, this, he said, is industrial age medicine where all the money stuff happens at the top of the pyramid and self-care, that big red area there, is off the map. Nobody knows what happens there, right? He said that with the internet, it was going to get turned on its head to information age healthcare, and he predicted then that the individual self-care at the top would have a next layer of friends and family self-help networks, which we are just really seeing blooming now, right? Um, and then professionals as facilitators, partners, and then as authorities. He published these slides in February of 1995, less than a year after the first Mozilla browser came out. Now that's a visionary if you can see what the long-term concepts of that are. So I say, let's listen to what this guy was talking about. Well, this is a number of his friends. Uh, just over his left elbow there, left on from our view, is Danny Sands, my primary physician. Two slots to the right is John Lubkowski. Way over uh, on the far left is a, a Frenchman who lived in Manhattan named Gilles Friedman, who now is in Silicon Valley with his startup. Uh, he had started a listserv, just a plain old emailing list when his wife had metastatic breast cancer, uh, and he turned it into this network of pa cancer patient communities called ACOR. Uh, and there's Alan and Cheryl Green, who formed the first physician website recognized by the AMA, uh, drgreen.com, still in business today, and on and on. And he coined this term e-patients. Now, originally the e stood for electronic, like e-commerce and e-everything else. But he added these terms later, equipped, engaged, empowered, enabled. If you are an empowered patient, now, if you think for yourself and speak up and so on, I bless you, you are an e-patient. There is no certification test. Just be that way, okay? That's all it takes. Uh, and it's common for physicians and nurses who were trained that no such thing could possibly exist to think, well, this just doesn't exist. Right? Well, our work as evangelists is to spread the word in a way that builds partnerships. Now, Here's how this played out for me. I had never heard the term uh, e-patient. This was, uh, I had moved away from the Boston area to the Midwest for a few years. And in 2006, I moved back. And I wrote to Dr. Sands and said, will you take me back? And he said yes. And we scheduled uh, an annual physical for uh, the New Year's week. And I sent him an agenda email. Now, some people say, you sent your doctor an agenda? Well, he's glad I did, because he had things he wanted to go over also. I mean, in one other area of life, visiting a lawyer or an accountant or whatever, if you have an appointment with somebody you don't see very often who's a valuable professional, do you spring the agenda on them when you show up? That just doesn't make sense. Here's one of the items I was dealing with. As the appointment approached, I had a weird thing happening in my right eye. It was kind of a sparkly, blurry thing. And at first, I thought I had just some goop in my eye, and I tried to wipe it out, and it wouldn't go. And then it's, this, it got bigger. And I'm, I remember standing in my kitchen thinking, what is this? And over the course of the next half hour, as it got bigger, I could see it was kind of crescent-shaped. Now, if there are any MDs in the audience or people who do diagnosis, I'm sure your mind's thinking, could it be this, could it be that, what about that? Well, so anyway, within a half hour, it had outgrown the eye and it was gone. Being a child of the 60s, my first thought was flashback. You know? <laughs> but then when the exact same thing happened two weeks later, exact same thing, I thought, what was that? And the third time it happened, I started taking notes. Now, the usual way to handle this with your provider is you get into the office and start telling the story like that. And the clock is ticking on the insurance governed minute, governed minutes and all of that. I went online and I Googled. I didn't know what I was Googling for. I hunted for more than two hours thinking, no, it's not like this, it's not like this, it's not like this. And finally there was something, ah, it is like this. And I pasted it into my email. Okay, I pasted the picture in, um, and I pasted in the URL, same as you do when you're sure. You want to say to somebody, I found this, what do you think? See, that's the partnership, the colleague relationship. Uh, I gave some descriptions of how mine was slightly different, and I pasted in my little diary of episodes. 
just in case it might be useful. And if you didn't care, you wouldn't have to spend time on it. Now, people say patients should not diagnose themselves on the internet. I couldn't agree more. Who am I to make a diagnosis? Have you ever seen, well, I know many of you have, the kinds of questions you have to answer right to get a medical license? Holy cow. Uh, but this was a website about ophthalmic migraine. So I pasted that in with a question mark. See, I wasn't trying to be the doctor. I was trying to do everything in my power to communicate with my chosen expert. This is the partnership. So by the time we got to the visit, we were way ahead of just saying, well, I had this thing happen to my eye. Well, another thing that was in the agenda was I had a stiff shoulder. Now, it wasn't a sharp pain, wasn't a big deal, but you know, one of these things where I was just getting crusty, and instead of reaching up for something on a shelf, I'd rather do this. So I said, I'm probably going to need a referral to a, uh, a shoulder doctor. Uh, and we actually did that before the appointment came. This is the point in the story where I have a complete multi-sensory recall of what happened. One of my aphorisms in my book is, patient is not a third person word. Because when something like this hits your family, and it changes what life is like at your breakfast table, from that point on, you don't see the issues in the abstract anymore. So I had the physical on December 30th. On January 2nd, after the New Year's weekend, we, uh, uh, I went and had the shoulder x-ray with one of the Boston Red Sox team physicians. The next morning, I remember vividly, 9 a.m., I remember what the cubicle partition carpet looked like. I remember what the Sony desk phone looked like. I don't know what the mechanism is by which the mind so perfectly recalls the moment when your life changes. But at the TED conference where I spoke, about 20% of the speakers were patients. Much to my surprise, most of them in their speech named the date when they got this news. Anyway, he said, uh, it was Dr. Sands calling, uh, and he said, um, Dave, your shoulder's going to be fine, but there's something in your lung. We need to find out what it is. And that's a surprising thing to hear. Well, I went in for a CAT scan, and this is one of the five tumors we found in both lungs. This one's the size of a golf ball. Uh, and it raised this question. He said, usually something like this will break off from an abdominal organ and circulate in the blood and it gets stuck in the lungs and starts growing. So the, it raised the question, where's this from? Which conveniently enough abbreviates to WTF. <laughs> which is very much how I felt about things. My wife came with me. I had an abdominal ultrasound. Um, she's a veterinarian. She knows I'm not a dog, but she's seen lots of ultrasounds. And this is from a later MRI, uh, one of two primary tumors on the right kidney. And the adrenal gland, that turned out, was cancerous as well. Um, now, they wouldn't give me a prognosis or anything or even decide on treatment until they had a biopsy, which is the correct thing to do. But we went home and we looked up kidney cancer, right? Uh, and what did, we, what did we see? Like WebMD, almost all patients are incurable. Same as with Match.com, I don't like the first result, I keep looking. <laughs> right? What do I get? Outlook is bleak. Prognosis is grim to the third page of Google search results. And I'm going into this. I mean, honestly, it was, a pretty, it was pretty emotional and upsetting. I'm going into this because for those of you who haven't realized it yet, I want you to understand why some people will say, please, what can I do to help? You know, I, this is a diagram of stage four kidney cancer from the website of the drug that I eventually got, high dose interleukin-2. Totally by coincidence, there's that thing in my lung. I'm a poster child. The first pain I had was in my left femur. I had a big metastasis in my left femur. In May of that year, I fainted and landed on it, and it broke. Some people think empowered patients are anti-doctor. Are you kidding? I can stand on that leg now. You know? I'm fixed. Hallelujah. There's one in the skull. Well, that's in the brain. Mine was in the cranium. I have a moth eaten area in the back now. And because I'm an overachiever, uh, I have these additional tumors everywhere, including if you look at the head again, three weeks before the treatment started, I had a tumor erupt out of my tongue. 
I had a kidney cancer tumor growing in my mouth. And by the time I found a website, the doctors correctly would not give me a number. They said there isn't enough good data about patients like you. Uh, but I have, the nurse practitioner who managed my case said she had just come from pediatric oncology and she had learned that she had to understand different patients' desires for information. Some people are just, I don't want to know, just take care of me, fix me, that's fine with me. I never say everybody should be like me. But when somebody wants to get involved, heavens, let's not smack them down. Anyway, I found a website. She knew the first words out of my mouth that I have an appetite for information. 24 weeks was my median survival. Now, I knew enough about statistics from college to know that that didn't mean I was going to be dead in 24 weeks. It's not that they gave him 24 weeks to live. But that was an indication of how sick I was. All right? And an amazing thing happened. Danny Sands, remember Danny Sands? He knew Jill Friedman, who founded ACOR, and he told me, you're an online kind of guy, Dave. You might want to join this community. Now, this is important, because a lot of people think I went rogue and went out and found something my hospital didn't know about. My doctor recommended this as a known good website to the extent that medical professionals can recommend good resources, the patients I know welcome that, okay? Consider, in the first two hours after I posted my first note in this community, the advice I got, first thing they said was, welcome to the club that nobody wants to be in. You know, serious. They, some of us make it, some of us don't. And, you know, for me, the question that was burning in my mind that I could not get an answer for on the Kidney Cancer Association, uh, National Institutes of Health, anywhere, was how likely is it that I'm dying right now? Now, by scientific standards, there may not be any validated answer to that, all right? But to the patients, they, they understand why uh, I wanted to know that. And they, they said, well, so here's one way to look at it. They said that this disease does not look good, but some people make it, and all you can do is be looking ahead. They said, if your issue is you don't want to die of cancer, consider that if you die of something else first, you didn't die of cancer. And I swear to you, if you feel trapped, the idea that there is a possibility, because then the game becomes just live long enough to get hit by a truck or have a heart attack or something else. Well, and the next thing beyond that is live long enough for another treatment to come along. And again, if you feel nobody could get that published in a peer-reviewed journal, right? And yet, so this is part of the mystery, how come that's actually useful to patients? I know a guy who was diagnosed the same month as me and over the years has gone through six different treatments and a year and a half ago finally was no evidence of disease. All right, so this is not just malarkey. Anyway, here's what they said. It's an uncommon disease. Find a hospital does a lot of cases. There's no cure, but this stuff, high dose interleukin-2, sometimes works. They said it usually doesn't, but when it does, about half the time, it's permanent. Voila. The side effects are severe. They sometimes kill patients. That's why you've got to uh, get to a specialist hospital that does a lot of cases. Don't let them give you anything else first. And by the way, here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. Woohoo. To this day, none of this is in the medical literature. And I didn't go rogue. I took this to my oncologist and said, what do you think? And he said, they're right. One of the core things that Tom Ferguson wrote about in his manifesto that he was working on when he died in 2006, he got some funding from Robert Wood Johnson to do this, was something called the lethal lag time. The time between when new knowledge comes into existence and it reaches clinicians. Okay? And the patient community described it this way. They said, now cancer is measured in five-year survival numbers. That's fine. But the newest available information right now is for work that was done in 2000. Because you do an intervention in 2000, you wait five years, you measure the survival stuff, it takes a couple years to get published. Meanwhile, a center of excellence like my hospital is not standing still. They're creating the future that will be documented 10 years from now. 
So for instance, and this is important stuff because this goes to the core of the scientific method, it challenges the assumptions by which we practice medicine. The literature, the only paper at the time on this, said that 14% of patients respond to high dose interleukin-2 and 4% die of the side effects. Now, an oncologist who doesn't see a lot of cases will look in the official cancer database and say, well, I'm not going to try that. That's ridiculous. 86% of people have no effect. All it does is cost money and kill 4% of people. The patient community knew that it was up to 20% and that a center of excellence did not lose many patients, even though in that study back in 1994 they had. I, I asked my oncologist and he said actually we're up to 25% respond now because we're better at choosing who to select for it and we've lost two patients out of our last 1,200. Really? Isn't that interesting? Well, anyway, long story short, short, surgery and interleukin worked. I mean, I had surgery for the broken leg, of course, but beyond that, see, interleukin is one of the early immunological cancer treatments, right? They didn't have to count all the lesions in my body and go in and surgically remove them. It's a systemic treatment. They removed the kidney and the interleukin went boom to the rest of the body and everything else went away. My treatment started April, 20, April 7 and ended July 23rd. I've had nothing since then, and I'm all better. In fact, a year later, my doctor sent an email. I had been losing weight rapidly by the time the treatment started, so I had orders to like, they actually sent me a diet how to increase your caloric intake. Have pizza for snacks, put whipped cream on desserts. I'm not kidding. Uh, he sent me an email a year later and said, you have not expired, but your order to eat more has, because all my weight came back. <laughs> so, that's what you can have when you have that kind of relationship. Um, and being a change agent, I'm wondering what's the establishment thing. So three years ago, when the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, one of the most respected journals in the world, asked me to submit an essay you, may, you can imagine my surprise on that. Uh, I didn't just want to give them my perspective. They said, we think what happened to you is important and needs to be published. Uh, I asked, I knew this was going to be read by clinicians around the world. So I asked my oncologist, what would you say to other oncologists about what happened to me? No, I didn't go interpreting things. And, uh, Anyway, he said, you were really sick. I don't know if you could have tolerated enough medicine if you hadn't been so well informed. You know what that was about? That was about side effects. Most of his patients don't survive, right? Either the, either the treatment doesn't work or the, the side effects um, cause them to discontinue the treatment. I thought, okay, side effects might kill, kill me. Where's my training? How do I prepare for the side effects? They didn't have anything. Now they do. They have a pamphlet on side effects, dealing with side effects. I turned to the literature. Nothing. Of course, there's no peer-reviewed articles on side effects of high dose interleukin-2. It's obscure. I turned to the patient community, and I got 17 first-hand stories. So every side effect that hit me, there was no guaranteed out for it. I almost died. At one point, I got capillary leak syndrome. The immune system drug caused the walls of my capillary to open capillaries to open up, all the fluid went out, my blood pressure dropped to 50 over 30, my legs were like water balloons and they discontinued the treatment. But in my case, I've had enough, and for me it worked. And this is what he says, he since said that he wishes he could bottle whatever it was I did and administer it to other patients. So who am I? Go argue with him. Well, so here's the question for the scientific mind, how can it be? that the most relevant information can possibly exist outside of where we were rigorously trained to look. How can that be? Well, it turns out there's a real answer set it that can satisfy the engineering or scientific mind. This is a nice cutesy diagram about social media. Ooh, we're all connected. 60 degrees of Kevin Bacon and all that stuff. But it turns out there's a valid metaphor here. Information in medicine is like a nutrient and you've got to be kidding. So I just found out I have five minutes left. Wow. Um, the uh, information is like a nutrient that enables a healthier response where it's present. And these dotted lines are exactly like capillaries. 
They are the pathways through which information can travel to the point where it's needed. All right, and that, so now this is the, the, the medical school um, uh, in the Netherlands that I mentioned where I did my TED talk has been working on this conceptual diagram for five years. Uh, it used to be truly, no kidding, that all knowledge and assets and everything was uh, concentrated above the horizon in the institution and necessarily transmitted to a lower level. Uh, the second, the, the current generation, my case and others, occasionally e-patients bring information to the table, which improves what's possible. And the future world that we're moving into that is happening now, health 3.0, 4.0, and beyond, we're all swimming in a common pond of information. I'm still not an oncologist. Okay, I'm not even a physical therapist, for heaven's sake. But what I'm capable of bringing to the case is different than it was 50 years ago. This is Tom Ferguson's amazing breakthrough. And now we understand that the mechanism here is all of these different players all have their own networks of capillaries. And if you're into IT, information theory, information science, you'll recognize that this is the transformation from a closed system to an open network. And it makes new things possible. To deny this is to be operating, it's almost as if somebody in another industry was operating in a pre-internet world. Same sort of situation. Now there's an objection. There's garbage on the internet. Well, indeed, we've discussed that. One of John Lubkowski's friends, this great guy, Howard Rheingold, spoke at the Medicine X conference uh, at Stanford this fall, and he warned about this. There's crap on the internet. I mean, we all want reliable information, right? So what do we assume about where to get it and what to avoid is the real question. Um, the scientific literature? Well, not according to the editors. Get ready for a teeny shock here. Richard Smith, 25-year editor of the British Medical Journal, said most of what appears in journals is scientifically weak. Now, he has a reputation for having something of a bad attitude after 20 or 25 years of doing this. So now we hop across the pond to the New England Journal, where Marcia Angel said it's simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that appears in journals. What? That was a few years ago as she retired. But of course, things must have gotten better since then, right? Well, here's Richard Horton of The Lancet this year saying much of the literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Now, this is an enormous disservice to clinicians as well as patients. It took a full generation to get medicine to switch to evidence-based medicine, and now we're telling them, well, <laughs> Half of it just might be garbage. Remember when Watson uh, kicked butt on Jeopardy, right? It can read a gazillion pages a second, read the whole internet every day, something like that. How would you, and I actually asked one of Watson's programmers this at Medicine X, I said, how would you program Watson differently if you had to tell it that half of everything it reads is wrong? And in fact, the current Watson for Health, they are no longer depending on the literature. They've turned it into a different kind of cognitive thinking machine. Amazing. And you can go on about that. So I said, maybe we need a crap detector for the medical literature. Wouldn't that be interesting? Uh, by the way, Howard was there. I was there. I got him to autograph my copy of the Whole Earth Catalog. That made me happy. Now, you know a movement is a social revolution when the artists and musicians show up. <laughs> uh, but, but this is important, because I think we are going to start hearing folk songs and maybe even protest songs. Uh, in this movement. A funny early version of it that was ended up in my TED talk is there's a health IT guy outside Boston named Keith Boone who wrote the e-patient rap. I want to be an e-patient just like Dave. Well, uh, meanwhile, there's this four minute rock video. This IT guy, Ross Martin, uh, has a garage band and he wrote this song. It's a parody of blue suede shoes. I want to the doctor to for the nurse. He's saying he's trying to treat me so to make me feel worse. Give me my damn data. Boom, boom about patient access to the medical record. Uh, and then he did E-Patient Dave's PHR. It's a parody of Alice's Restaurant. Well, anyway, this is Regina Holliday. If you have a chance to get her to come speak, I seriously recommend it. She painted this jacket. 
This is the first, this is the phone call where she met me while her husband was dying of my disease. Uh, this was a 60-foot mural on the side of a gas station that she was painting after his death. She is an activist and she is determined to fix health care. This subset of that mural, um, see she, had, she and her husband had been to three bad hospitals in Washington, D.C., horror stories along the way, and then a mutual friend said, uh, bumped into her and discovered that her husband was dying, and he, uh, she said, kidney cancer, oh no, you've got to talk to e-patient Dave. She said, basically, I know a guy on Twitter. All right, and on that phone call, all right, she was cooking macaroni. They were a poor family in Washington, D.C., them and, and two, two young sons living in a one-bedroom apartment. She was cooking macaroni and cheese. Her son was clinging to her leg, and she was talking to me. The next day, she was talking to my oncologist in Boston, and when he saw the scans, he said, sometimes it's too late. Uh, she has turned her loss into this activism. She paints murals, uh, and she now has 350 of these jackets that she has created. She is, um, uh, she calls it the walking gallery of healthcare. Her deal is this, she doesn't sell these jackets. You tell her your medical story, good or bad, she will, and send her a jacket, and she will paint it for free. Uh, as long as you will promise to wear it to medical conferences, because they start conversations. I walk through an airport or any place else and people say, oh, what's that? How's that for an activist, a citizen activist saying, this shall change? There she is with the other Regina, Surgeon General Regina Benjamin. She got some attention there, huh? And on Forbes last year, will Regina Holiday become healthcare's Rosa Parks? I'm seriously talking about a movement that started here in Austin with Tom Ferguson. Uh, I want to quickly touch on this, the essence of paternalistic caring, okay? This is important because there are times when somebody needs to be taken care of, all right? The essence is, no, 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 sorry, you don't know what you need. I'll take care of you. I'll decide that for you. This is my granddaughter, thank you. Uh, and I had this epiphany when she was born two years ago. I thought, you know, everybody talks about paternalism as a bad thing, but I realized here she is in her car seat in the car. When she goes for a ride in the car, she's put in a rear-facing car seat in the back seat, and she's taken where she needs to go. She has no capacity to understand what the issues are. This is appropriate in that situation. But she's now two and a half, and she has discovered the magic two-year-old word, no. <laughs> She has opinions, and like last time we went out to dinner, as we were heading toward the garage, she stopped us and said, no pop pop vroom vroom, which is her word for car, mom vroom vroom. We're gonna go in mom's car. She's, within a few years, she'll be saying where she wants to go. Sooner or later, she will become a driver. Some of the people her age will get killed. As, as young drivers, it is our, our, our charter, our responsibility here is to understand as people's capacity to understand things changes, how do we alter how we interact with them? Great definition of empowerment here. As, as people in nursing, uh, you've got a lot of one-to-one -one contact, and this is, this is just great. Wait till you hear where this came from. I got this from a patient, of course, speaking at a medical conference. Empowerment is increasing the capacity of individuals or groups to make choices about what they want, their capacity, right? And to transform those choices into actions and outcomes. Now, somebody who can't do that is powerless in the world. This is the definition the World Bank uses when they go into a developing nation, and people there don't know how to govern themselves, don't know how to conduct business, and so on. They get to work on increasing the capacity of people to make choices and take effective action. This is the work of empowering patients who are not yet activated, don't realize how they can help run their lives. The Institute of Medicine, in case you think this is all anti establishment published this report in 2012 where they said we need a learning health care system and number two of the four pillars was patient clinician partnerships with engaged empowered patients 
how about that? The Institute of Medicine <laughs> says partnerships with engaged, empowered patients. And guess what? I bet hardly anybody here in this room knew that that has been declared three years ago because information doesn't automatically go out and reach everybody's brain. It takes time. It's the work of activism. Now, another objection, and here's where it gets a little bit fun and annoying at the same time. I commonly hear, well, okay, that's okay for you. You're an MIT graduate and blah, blah. My patients aren't like that. They're not asking for this. Well, 100 years ago on election day, this flyer was circulated. The National Association opposed the women's suffrage. Like we should not give women the vote. Why? Number one on the list, because 90% of women aren't asking for it. Really, exactly like, well, my patients aren't asking for this. Has anybody ever sat down and explained to them why they might want to or what they would do with it and so on? And I love, you know, when cognitive dissonance sets in, something is happening, people can't believe, all right? The mind goes crazy. Look at what they came up with next. 80% of women eligible to vote are married, so they could only duplicate or cancel their husband's vote, so why bother? It's like, what? <laughs> what are you thinking about? And down at the bottom, it's unwise to risk the good we already have for the evil which may occur. <laughs> well, so this is part of, did anybody here see the 45 vintage sexist ads thing that went around on Facebook a couple years ago? At 45 vintage sexist ads that would not go down so well today. Some of them are too risque to show, but I'll show you just a couple. And these are from within my lifetime, mind you. So we're not talking about archaic stuff, at least not archaic to me. Anyway, how about this? Sure, it's a nice The guy gets dressed for work and gets back in bed. <laughs> So his wife can kneel in her robe and lift up the breakfast to him. Uh, yeah, Van Hughes and Man's World. Here's another one. This is from 1963. I recognize the typesetting. It's nice to have a girl around the house. Gasps. And notice the company. This is from Legs, the pantyhose company. Well, they had men's pants they were trying out now. And I know you can't read the fine print, but I'll read it. Though she was a tiger lady, our hero didn't have to fire a shot to floor her. After one look at his pants, she was ready to have him walk all over her. Really? Really? And look at the look on her face, no less. This is how you sell pants to men. Well, and then finally, the one that echoes my testimony in Washington, although I didn't know it at the time, Sooner or later, your wife will drive home one of the best reasons to own a VW. It's the crumpled fender, and the body copy says, women are soft and gentle, but they hit things. Um, and when, you, when she brings home a crumpled fender out of VW, it's cheap. Only costs $25, $24.95 plus labor. Well, that's, so when people say culture change is hard, I don't want to have to change culture. I assure you, it is possible to change culture when enough people say, this, this is not going to happen anymore. Well, so uh, to, to, bring, to come close to wrapping up, important to know, Googling is a sign of patient engagement. The only reason anybody ever goes Googling about a symptom is because they want to know more than they already do. If they are not good at it, we should encourage it. But a sign that our movement is getting attention is that the empire is starting to strike back. What I'm about to tell you is true. The Belgian government is spending taxpayer money on a Google ad campaign saying, don't Google it. <laughs> All right? And they, not only are they spending money on that, but they had two excellent professionally produced videos produced. Uh, uh, with this little vignette here. Husband has an owie on his finger, okay? Wife bandages it up, but then she goes on the internet and she starts getting scared. You notice he has lumps coming out of his forehead now? Oh. Right? Um, well, she said, oh, I found somebody who's online who said when this happened, they had this and that happen. I will wait for the phone to stop. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Within one minute of the commercial, he's got lumps coming out of his face and he's bleeding to death, all right? And the ad 
at the end says, don't Google it, consult a professional. And so this was tied in with that coffee mug post. Don't confuse your Google search. So I mean, it takes something though to, to articulate what's exactly wrong with that. What I said was, Googling it and consulting a professional are not mutually exclusive. You know, I would say, learn what you can. You know, and then meanwhile, evidence grows that the current paradigm is collapsing. But of course, learn what you can, but still consult somebody who knows what they're doing. Sad story, this year, this 19-year-old died in the UK. She had a liver cancer, and uh, it was cured, and she started feeling sick again, but they said, this cancer doesn't come back. Well, she and her mom saw stuff online that said, it does come back, and the doctor said, stop Googling, and she died. Uh, and this summer, they apologized for their role. Uh, in her death. There is a real penalty to being significantly out of date with your understanding of how things work. The first generation of e-patients, Tom Ferguson in the BMJ in 2004 said, the emerging world of the e-patient cannot be fully understood and appreciated. And regarding old people, and this is, we're going to wrap up then, uh, Ligia Ricciardi, who used to be what she called the consumerista, at, uh, at the Health and Human Services Department, just tweeted this earlier this month. It's a misperception that older people don't want to use technology. You just got to make it fit their needs. So, uh, speaking of that, have you noticed there are a lot more old people? You know why? I mean, you know, getting off airplanes, all of a sudden now sometimes there's five or six wheelchairs there. It's because y'all saved us from dying! I tried to die in my 50s. But you saved me. Here's my college classmate, Jay. He said on Facebook a couple years ago, he's having a pacemaker put in. The reason he's having a pacemaker put in is because twice in the previous 10 years, medicine saved him from dying. He's the first man in his family to live to age 65. Woohoo! Now, the result, Pew Research published these incredible diagrams earlier this year. They took the census data and turned, into, turned them into what I call these beehive diagrams. Five-year bands, the dark bands are baby boomers. So 1950 is when I was born. This is what the population pyramid looked like. Here it is today. You will notice people tend not to be dropping out and dying. Instead, they're getting old. And we've got a lot more people proportionally over age 65. One generation from now, when I turn 100, which I am planning to do, this is what it will look like. The right side of each one is women, the left side is men. Notice in 2050, that top bar, the right side, is women 85 and older. It's 3% of the US population. Can you imagine one person in 30 being an 85-year-old woman or older? Boy, oh boy, oh boy. One thing, one thing I bet you'll see is that wheelchairs will no longer look like they were stolen from a hospital, they'll start, they'll start to look like high-tech strollers, you know, with, you know, drink carriers and all kinds of appendages. Why not? I mean, the tray of, it's ridiculous. My wife had both her knees replaced this summer, and the, the, the wheelchairs are, you know, why, on, why don't they have a tray with like an iPad holder and things like that, you know? Um, anyway, even Bruno Mars will get old if he lives long enough. Watch this. So, that's it. Boy, has the world changed, right? New things are possible, truly. Reality has changed, and culture is changing. I say, game on. Let patients help heal health care. Tom Ferguson titled his manifesto that his friends finished after his death, e-patients, how they can help us heal health care. And on the e-patient blog, it's available not just in English, but now in Spanish as well. What did I hear somebody say around here? What starts in Austin changes the world? I'd say that's true. We are a catalyst for change. We are driven to solve society's issues. Thank you for the work you do.
We got started late, and I talked longer than I was supposed to, but I'm happy to keep on. Do you have a few questions? Oh, absolutely. At this time, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand, and we'll try and Thank you. Uh, Dave, I um, first met you in 2008 at your first Harvard Quality Colloquium. Oh you may remember, I know, where you showed uh, getting to walk your daughter down the aisle, and it was a really exciting uh, thing for us to all cheer. And Atul Gawande also was just getting started then, too. You were both there. Um, but I wanted to really thank you for coming to Texas and being here with us today, and thank all of you so much you brought Dave here. Um, one of the questions I'm going to ask you is that um, since that time, since 2008, we see a lot more of the patient and fam family advisory councils. I know yes. the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has a, a booklet out now about how to really form those, kind of the toolkit style. Are you involved in that in any way, or do you promote the patient, the, the concept of patient and family advisory councils and doctor's offices and hospitals and other places? Well, so it's a great, it's a great question. The, I'm, I'm not personally involved, but I've talked to a lot of people who are, uh, and it's, it's really hard to get started sometimes because nobody knows how to do this new dance. You know, I mean, uh, in, in college, we shifted from boy leads, girl follows, to stepping on each other's feet and then eventually becoming graceful. Sometimes it takes off great, but very often it starts out with the hospital saying, well, all right, we'll bring them in, we'll give them milk and cookies and show them what we're working on. All right, this is very analogous to the famous thing about you lay out a sidewalk, uh, and but then you know the the citizens come along and they just cut across the lawn because what they wanted is not what you had designed. And but it takes an awakening. You've got to coach people and say, well, no, you know, if you could have anything, really, what would it be? And that can take some time, but it's really noble work. Another slide in that Institute of Medicine report that I didn't show says that the, uh, they said a learning healthcare system is anchored on patient needs and perspectives. Now that's challenging. It's not, here's what we're working on, what do you think? You know, if you start with what patients find valuable. Here's an example. I spoke this week at the radiology conference in Chicago, and I, preparing for that, I thought back in our society for participatory medicine, a few years ago, there was a famous blogger who had her first MRI. And how many people here have ever had an MRI themselves? You remember what that first one was like? They had been, they never give you any warning that this is going to be like monkeys banging on garbage cans while you're claustrophobic. And she said, this put her into PTSD. Well, we started um, a hashtag that never really went anywhere. Why don't they have a stupid YouTube that says this is what it's going to be like to be in that machine? And before the technician puts you in there, why don't they say, have you done the training? If you start from the patient's perspective, I mean, that costs nothing compared to the of those machines, right? So, so that's the thing. Uh, teach everybody to, to think from, and by the way, never, ever, ever let anybody say, well, we're all going to be patients someday. No. No, no, no. Some patients get almost violent when they hear that. Because until you are the one who is either scared to death for them, themselves or a family member, or you're the one who is suffering from being woken up six times through the night for various blood tests and so on, until you know what that's like, you have no right to say, we'll all be patients some way, some, someday, okay? So patient and family advisory councils are a good thing, but it can take some doing to get people to say what they really want. Because people tend to assume that if it were possible to do what they want, somebody would have done it. Somebody else? Dave Oh, thank you. Um, There's one, another one in the back next. Information is, is really uh, useful as a medical professional, I believe. Because it, this information can certainly be challenging when people come in with, uh, let's take the vaccine issue, when parents yes. come in, they go to, uh, thank you. They go to uh, Dr. Google. Dr. Google says the vaccine's going to cause autism in your child. And to overcome that is a difficult conversation when you have a bunch of bloggers blogging that kind of information. So what is your advice for a healthcare professional to tr try to tell the patient 
what true medical information is and what medical information is not? So it turns out that it's a great question because the core fundamental principle question there is what information is reliable? Right? The same as Howard's, the, the need for a crap detector on the medical literature. Did you know that something like half of all clinical trials that are, maybe it's a third of all clinical trials that are registered with the FDA, the results never get uh, reported? Uh, that Ben Goldacre, a doctor in the UK, says this is a cancer at the core of evidence-based medicine because what happens is a lot of studies where the results are not favorable, they just suppress the evidence. Pure scientific corruption and it's a real problem. So the, um, first of all, um, so there's a discussion on that coffee mug blog post on epatients.net today, uh, a debate between doctors who are pro-Googling and anti-Googling. So there's a lot, a lot of good thinking to chew into there. But Susanna Fox, that same researcher when that happened, said a few years ago, hang on, the smoking gun on the vaccine autism problem was in the top tier medical journal. They didn't notice that the data had been forged. And then, so the anti-vaccine people said, well, I'm pointing to a top-tier peer-reviewed medical journal. So as I say, the core issue is how can we know what's certain? And everybody needs to learn, everybody, that we, step, we as patients step into the ring to participate in this discussion. We're responsible for wising up. And if providers want to welcome them, they've got to be responsible for doing the coaching as well. It's not trivial, it's a valid point. But on the other hand, what really bugs me, really bugs me, uh, is when some physicians, a minority, but some, get arrogant and say, I'm the one with the medical degree, stop Googling. Right? We need to be in it together, including the uncertainty. Not comfortable, is it? That's a time of change. We have one more over here. Uh, Dave, thanks for what you're doing. Um, as a patient, uh, there's a couple of parallel systems. I mean, there's, there's the traditional system, what's taught in the medical schools, and then as a patient, obviously you, you consult the patient community, and you'll find Chinese medicine, you'll find functional medicine, yep. you'll find alternatives, you'll find complementary medicines, you'll find botanicals, you'll find all these different things. And so when so there's a dilemma on how to integrate all of this stuff, what's legit, what isn't. Yep. And so it's it's really super complicated. Is there any rules of thumb that you have about integration of the parallel systems for the patient? Well, I don't I don't know about integration. I, again, I think the the core issue is how do you decide what's reliable. There's a big debate uh, for the last couple of years in the MD world on maintenance of certification. You know, specialists having to get recertified, and I don't know all the issues there, but I will point to, there are some, first of all, I, after one of my speeches a few years ago, a doctor came up to me and said regarding evidence-based medicine, he said contemptually, I don't want to have to practice medicine out of some damn cookbook. I want the autonomy to practice as I see fit. He didn't care about the evidence, literally, explicitly. And some people have told me they were trained decades ago that they were basically ready to be a doctor and go out and have a good life. Now, in one of the maintenance of certification debates on the blog of a, a well-known doctor named Bob Wachter, uh, one doctor said, I was licensed to practice medicine 38 years ago. How dare you suggest I don't know what I'm doing? Yep. And I and I lots of stories of patients saying that their doctor recommended specifically obsolete information. Yep. So it's there is no easy answer. I will tell you that in my patient community, and the, one of our challenges is I wish there were a community this good for every condition. You know, including uh, the toenail problems, you know? But they, every six months or so, some idiot shows up there because the door is always open and says, hey, have you heard about Laetrile? You know, they, it'll, it'll cure cancer in an instant. And the community stops on them and kicks them out because the, the wisdom now lives in the community, right? And that's, you know, there are, there are cultures around the world where the, the neighborhood culture is what really runs things. So, 
No, no easy answer, uh, but that's. Did, did you have a follow-up question? No, or? no, I'm just saying thanks. Good. Are we finished?